Where is wave energy? In our context, it's obvious really, in our seas and in our oceans. Approximately 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, so potentially, there are a lot of waves. To get large amounts of consistent wave energy, we need a large body of water and strong wind speeds from a consistent direction. A large body of water is important as it increases the fetch, which is the length of water over which a given wind may blow. A wave is created as the wind transfers energy to the surface of the water, and this continues along the fetch, increasing the wave's energy until it becomes a fully developed sea. This is where it has reached a maximum amount of energy, and any further energy transferred to the water is dissipated by wave breaking. Larger bodies of water can be a much greater and more consistent source of wave energy as there is enough distance or fetch for the wave to become fully developed and there is less chance it will be fetch limited. Now, what about the winds? These drive the waves so that their predominant direction will correspond to the direction at which the winds are at their most powerful. The most consistently powerful winds are considered to be westerlies where air mass moves from regions of high to low pressure these frequently occur in the mid-latitudes, north of the Tropic of Cancer and south of the Tropic of Capricorn. With the key requirements for creating waves in mind, let's start thinking about what this means for where we find a good wave energy climate. The fetch means we can assume that the seas off the northwest coasts of Scotland and Ireland will be more energetic than the seas off the northwest coast of England. Meanwhile, the prevailing weather direction means we can also assume that the northwest coast of Scotland will have much more energy than the east coast of the United States of America. The westerly winds, which drive the prevailing wave direction, are stronger in the winter months than in the summer, when higher pressures over the polar regions produce competing easterly winds. This seasonality is more pronounced in the northern hemisphere, where there is more interaction between the ocean and the land masses. Seasonality is a very important consideration in the planning of installation and maintenance of wave energy systems. Depending on the water depth and the wavelength, water particles move differently. The easiest region to predict and to model is deep water, which typically occurs when the water depth is greater than 50 metres. In this region, the offshore wave particles move in a circular orbit. The energy is transferred between orbits but the water particles don't actually move from their mean position. These circular orbits are largest near the surface and get progressively smaller as you go deeper below the surface. This tells us there is more energy available to extract near the water surface, but progressively less the deeper you get. At depths of more than about 50 meters below the surface, there will be hardly any motion and so hardly any wave energy at all. Near the coastline, as the water depth decreases, the influence of the seabed causes the water particle orbits to compress, becoming progressively more elliptical in shape, and you start to dissipate the energy which is built up in the wave. For some wave devices, installation along the coastline can also be attractive from an economic and from an engineering perspective, as you could consider mounting them directly on the seabed or on existing shore-based structures. The largest waves that can exist in this region are smaller than those in deep water, which can make the extreme design conditions less challenging, but the remaining energy can still be sufficient to make the wave device economically viable. So far, when we've referred to a wave, we are actually referring to the overall resultant wave trace, which is composed of many contributing waves of different heights, frequencies and directions. The reduction in wave energy at the coast is due to several dissipative mechanisms, such as friction and wave breaking, which affect these contributing waves. There are many aspects that designers need to be aware of, which affect different regions of the sea and the design of wave energy converters. Some of these include water mixing with the air in breaking waves results in highly oxygenated water. Exposure to this increases the risk of corrosion. Shorter, steeper breaking waves increase the number of large impulse slam loads experienced by the structure. Additional strengthening or reinforcement may need to be added in order for the structure to survive. Modelling of breaking waves and the nearshore wave climate requires a lot of empirical data and considerably more processes. These result in the numerical simulations being highly complex and computationally expensive.
If you can harness wave energy, it is a very attractive renewable resource. There is a significant amount of potential across many regions of the world, and the available power per square metre can be more than four times higher than wind and almost ten times that of solar. We measure wave power in kilowatts per metre of wave front. For most circular or wide and thin pitching devices, this means that, in simple terms, a device that is four metres wide and placed in a wave resource of 25 kilowatts per metre could capture 100 kilowatts of power if it was 100% efficient. A word of caution though, this simplification doesn't hold for long and slender devices. Many of the leading devices are already capable of capturing energy with an efficiency between 30 and 40%, and the development of sophisticated geometries and control strategies will continue to further increase the amount of power captured. To illustrate the types of devices and end uses, we'll explore three examples of wave climates, up to approximately 25 kilowatts per meter, up to approximately 50 kilowatts per meter, and over 50 kilowatts per meter. For small or niche applications, such as powering a fish farm or satisfying the base electrical load of subsea sensors, we could aim for a wave climate of up to 25 kilowatts per meter. We could meet this requirement with single devices that are compatible to those which have been deployed in Wave Energy Scotland's three-stage novel Wave Energy Converter Programme. For utility scale power, such as powering a small settlement, we'd look at the regions of approximately 30 to 50 kilowatts per meter. These locations should be prioritized for the first wave farms. Devices may be about twice as large as those built in the novel WEC program and would be able to deliver over 10 times as much power. In the future, we may consider regions where the wave climate is higher than 50 kilowatts per meter. This is a very challenging environment to design for because of the high loads on a device's moorings, its structure and its method of distributing the converted energy. Installation and maintenance of the devices will also be difficult at more energetic locations because we can't just switch off the waves when it's convenient. To be viable, further development is needed, along with transfer of novel technology from other mature sectors and a greater level of operational experience. For now, we should keep a longer term eye on these locations. Wave energy and tidal energy are both forms of ocean energy. That means they are often discussed in the same context or mistaken for one another. Although they both involve water, it's really important to appreciate that their method of capturing energy and possible deployment locations are very different. As we've already highlighted, waves are caused by the wind blowing over the surface of the water. Tidal energy, on the other hand, is governed by the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, which is explained through Newton's law of universal gravitation. A key distinction between wave and tidal is that tidal flow moves in a single direction for several hours before reversing and flowing in the opposite direction, whereas the circular orbits of wave particles typically induce bi-directional motion of a wave device every 10 seconds or so. This makes the wave environment more challenging as most mechanical systems are not designed for such frequent changes of direction. To capture tidal energy, the most common systems use horizontal axis turbines which spin due to the tidal flow. They look very much like wind turbines, but can be smaller due to the water being significantly more dense than air. Wave energy devices, on the other hand, commonly consist of multiple bodies or volumes which move relative to each other in a linear or rotary bidirectional motion. To illustrate how diverse the range of wave technologies are, it's helpful to first consider another renewable technology. Wind. Most people would describe this as a three-bladed horizontal axis wind turbine, or words to that effect. There might be small variations between the different technologies. For example, blade length may vary, hub height may vary, the method of converting movement to electrical power may vary, but outwardly they all look very similar. It is likely you'll find the same if you were to describe a car, or an aeroplane. If you described a wave energy device though, you might say something like the Palamis P2 device, which was a multi-body attenuator, although you might have called it the sea snake. Alternatively, you may say the Oyster device by Aquamarine Power, an oscillating wave surge converter which is installed on the seabed, something you may have called the Flappy device. Or you might say something different, and the reason for this is that there are many different devices being developed by many different developers in order to satisfy the many different requirements that exist to capture wave energy. They all look different, 
but these devices can all be categorised into eight different families, which in turn can be roughly grouped into the different water depths and mooring systems that we may expect them to be best suited to in the future. Once you look in more detail at the devices within each family, you'll see variations that have been identified which enable operation across a much wider range of locations and depths, so it's important to remember that these are not necessarily the only regions they can operate in. The first set of device types considered are often installed in the deep water region, at water depths greater than 50 metres. These may have more compliant moodings, so that the power is captured on board rather than through movement relative to the seabed. An example of this would be an attenuator, which floats on the surface, oriented parallel with the incoming waves. It consists of at least two bodies which move relative to one another, and their relative pitch motion facilitates the mechanical to electrical energy conversion. Another device which would work in this type of environment is a bulge wave. This is a very long rubber tube which is filled with water. As a wave passes over the rubber, it induces a pressure pulse which grows in energy down the length of the tube until at one end this pulse is converted to electrical power by some means of power conversion technology. The amount of power that can be generated is governed by the length of the tube, the thickness of the rubber, and the grade of the rubber material. There are many examples of attenuators, such as the motion family of devices, with a smaller blue X being deployed in Stage 3 of Wave Energy Scotland's Novel Wave Energy Converter Programme, and their larger Blue Horizon, which has been advanced in Europe Wave. A Horizon 2020 funded project run by Wave Energy Scotland and the Energy Agency of the Basque Government. An example of a bulge wave device is the Checkmate Anaconda, which completed Stage 2 of WES's Novel Wave Energy Converter Programme. The transition from mid to deep water would be at around 50 metres water depth, and depending on the location, it may be much closer to the coastline. In this region, we'd expect to find devices like point absorbers, submerged pressure differential and rotating mass. These devices would generally have taut moorings, so they can move relative to the seabed or to themselves. A point absorber could be a single body device that has a taut connection to the seabed and which generates power by heaving up and down relative to the seabed as the wave passes. Alternatively, it could also be a multi-body device where the main structure moves relative to a second body which is some distance below it, such as a heave plate, and the relative motion between these two bodies generates the power. The submerged pressure differential device can outwardly appear quite similar to a point absorber, but they are submerged and multi-body. The device has a positive internal pressure, and the change in water head as the wave passes results in one of the bodies moving relative to the other. This varies the internal pressure and volume, while actuating a method of power conversion. A simple way to think about the movement is that in a wave trough there is less water above the device and so less vertical pressure acting down upon it, while at the wave peak there is a large body of water above the device, resulting in a larger force pushing the buoyant structure downwards. Rotating mass systems are a unique geometric design, which enables the device to combine yaw and roll movements to induce a mass to rotate about an axis within the structure. An example of a point absorber technology is the core power family of devices, a scaled version of which was tested at the European Marine Energy Centre, EMEC, in Orkney in 2018, with the first full-size system installed in Portugal in 2023. An example of a submerged pressure differential device is the Archimedes Wave Swing by AWS, which has also recently been tested at EMEC in a WES-funded programme, and finally an example of a rotating mass device is the Wellow Penguin. As we move closer to the coastline and into water depths of less than 25 metres or so, we would need to consider nearshore devices. At these depths, the device could be fixed to a shore-mounted structure or to the seabed through a foundation system. One technology synonymous with this environment is the oscillating wave surge converter. This moves due to the surge motion of the passing waves and has a positively buoyant structure which provides a restoring key force to ensure it moves back and forth rather than in one direction only. Overtopping is also often associated with the coastline. This device type is where the wave comes over a structure into a reservoir, where head is created relative to the sea. As the water exits back into the ocean, it passes through a water turbine to convert the energy. Finally, there is the oscillating water column. Generally, these are located along coastlines, but like many of the technologies introduced here, a lot of effort is going into demonstrating that they can also operate reliably as a floating structure out at sea. Oscillating water columns work by having an air chamber connected to the water, with the air getting sucked in and pushed out through an air turbine 
as the internal water level changes due to the passing waves. Examples of oscillating wave surge converters include the Oyster family of devices developed by Aquamarine Power and deployed in Orkney in 2009 and 2011, and the Wave Roller device, which is under development by AW Energy. An example of an overtopping device is the Wave Dragon, while an example of a floating oscillating water column, which can be deployed out at sea, is the Marmok device by IDOM. All in all, this makes eight different families, but there is a chance in the future that there will be others which are facilitated by novel forms of power conversion, such as direct generation or new structures, which may arise from ongoing research into flexible materials. We've only introduced a few of the many different devices, but as we've hinted, there are many more under development within each family that aim to deliver the best system that tackles their specific requirements, whether that is for utility scale market or niche market, or an ambitiously novel or a robust reliable system. Even if we begin to converge on a technology family in the future, it's very likely we'll still need several different types of devices to suit different locations and satisfy our energy needs from wave energy. If you've got a device far offshore, chances are that it'll be very different from something that'll be closer to the coastline. We are still working to understand the most suitable applications for each of these devices, and so we must continue to nurture a variety of technologies to ensure we can meet all needs for the end users. For now, you can find information and public deliverables from the technologies funded by Wave Energy Scotland in our Knowledge Library.